into which part would you put your best effort? Can it be a climax or, of course, a conclusion? Why, all of your answers would be legitimate. I bet the answer for most professional writers would be the first sentence. Book opening often sets the tone of the story and captures the reader's attention by making a huge impression. It also provides important clues to understand the overall message of the book. For example, Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice starts with this sentence. It is the truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. Austen summarized the major theme of this literature, the fuss around romance and marriage, in this single sentence. On the other hand, Vladimir Nabokov's Lolita begins as such. Lolita, light of my life, fire of my loins, my sin, my soul, Lolita. This sentence well depicts the passionate and creepy desire of the protagonist, setting the whole work's atmosphere. And it also implies that the narrator will be accused of his sin, his sexual love for Lolita, but nevertheless, it would be the brightest fire of his life. Besides, The Great Gatsby's first line is also famous for its suggestive message. We can presume from this line that the narrator, Nick Carraway, is thinking back on his life and he comes from advantages such as money, education, and breathing. This benefit will allow him to fit in reasonably well in the old money East Coast world, but, however, as his father gives this advice to him in his young and vulnerable days, Nick often judges other people without considering context or circumstances. So, this opening tells us one of his main weaknesses, and it's pretty significant because, during the rest of the novel, this snobbishness and this tendency to dismiss everyone else as being inferior is something to watch for in Nick's description of other people and events. And can you guess what the first sentence of Harry Potter, the world bestseller and perhaps the greatest fantasy franchise, is about? Surprisingly, it goes like this. Mr. and Mrs. Dudley of Number 4 Private Drive were proud to say that they were perfectly normal. Thank you very much. So Harry Potter starts with how Mr. and Mrs. Dudley is perfectly normal. This is quite unexpected when we recur the actual first scene of the film version where Dumbledore and McGonagher show their marvelous magic or are the fantastic creatures appear in Potter's resulting world? So why do you think Rowling chose Dudley's as the starting point of her epic fantasy novel? Maybe it is because Harry Potter connotes the message related to the concept of normality. But do you remember Mr. and Mrs. Dudley? Were they normal? To figure out whether they are really normal people or not, we should investigate more into the details about them. So, I already picked out key evidences for our little detective work. Let's dive into them one by one. First, Mr. Dudley was the director of a firm called Grunnings, which made drills. But why must it be drills, not the other things? There must be some good reasons for this setting. For one thing, we can safely assume that drill was chosen because it represents part of Mr. Dudley's identity. Drills are used to make holes forcibly to make the raw material into a bigger structure's component. In other words, drills transform an original thing into a normal one that fits a sort of social rule by compersion. Thus, drills indicate that for Mr. Dudley, normality is his pride and the standard that others should follow. That is why he picks the most boring types for work or cannot bear people who dress in extraordinary clothes. Meanwhile, Mrs. Dudley shows such a conservative set of values more strongly. She spends so much of her time craning over garden fences, spying on the neighbors, or she also gossips away happily about her neighbors. There would be two reasons for this spying and gossiping. First, to check whether Dudley's are following the standard of normality compared with others, and second, to monitor whether their neighbors are normal. 
As we can see in Mrs. Dudley's case, to judge whether we are normal or not, we need a certain standard and this standard always relies on other people to compare. However, interestingly, Mrs. Dudley or Aunt Petunia herself is far from being normal. That is because she has nearly twice the usual amount of neck. Besides, her sister Lily was a witch and her nephew Harry is the one who survived you-know-who. And of course, their greatest fear is that somebody would discover it. Thus, after all, their obsession for normality is the counter-evidence of their anxiety that they are not normal in fact. Later, it is also revealed that Petunia was a witch. So the reason why Dudley tried to hatch Harry's entrance into Hogwarts by all means and also force Harry to follow their standard of sensical normality is actually nothing more than their inner nervousness. They are not normal and they are afraid that they might diverge from the mainstream society. However, when we compel others to follow a certain pattern of behavior or lifestyle, no matter how normal or universal it is, it is bound to be violent, just as Mr. Dudley's dreams. Dudley's, who decide to hide Harry's magical past from him and make him live in a small closet under the stairs, and especially their son Dudley, who bullies Harry even by ducking Harry's head into the toilet, clarify that enforcement of normality can be severely violent. Nevertheless, Harry finds out he's a wizard and builds his identity based on his extraordinariness, not muggleness. And it gives us a significant message that we can live a fascinating life, although we are not normal or agreeable to the social standard. And what is even more important is that we cannot force normality on others, and also we should cast away our prejudice about unordinary people. In Harry Potter's world, normal people are rather marginalized, called muggles, and resulting society is filled with extraordinary figures who go against the conventional wisdom. For example, as Rowling illuminated in 2007, Dumbledore is gay. Besides, Luna Lovegood and Neville Longbottom are eccentric outcasts even in the resulting world, but they are entrusted with important missions within the story. Also, the most loved female character, Hermione, does not have female friends and is considered a nerd, plus she is a muggle bone. And Hagrid is a half-giant bone from one giant parent and an ordinary wizard or witch. Not to mention the goblins at the Green Gods Bank. They represent creatures that are not fully human. However, Rowling humanized them, so they can be easily perceived as low-status human categories. Rowling, who made all these representations of minorities, also once said in an interview as, the Potter books are a prolonged argument for tolerance for an end to bigotry. In practice, psychologists such as Loris Fezali and others proved the positive effect of Harry Potter and the prejudices toward the stigmatized group. In their research, Children who read Harry Potter showed a lower degree of discrimination towards social minorities such as LGBTQIA, immigrants, or refugees. This could be the most desirable example of literature changing the reality.